3. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 to 20. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve, with, serve him with one accord. From beyond the birds of Cush, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for then I will remove them from your midst, your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, and shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the land, and gather the outcasts. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I will restore your fortunes before your eyes says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this joy Sunday during the season of Advent and for the word you've given to us. God, I pray that your word will transform us this hour. God, would you, in my teaching, would you guard me from error and would you lead us in all truth? God, we lift up those in our congregations that are suffering now. We want to mention by name several. We want to pray for Paul Watts a season Centennial Hospital. We, God, we pray that you would strengthen him. God, would you help the doctors and nurses know how to, how to combat all the various issues that are afflicting him. God, we also want to pray for uh, Cheryl Adams and her family. We pray for her wellness after her car accident on Friday. We thank you that uh, no, uh, the damage wasn't too bad that happened to her. Um, although the car was destroyed, she was safe. But we pray for her and her family, for Tiffany, for her husband Terry, for their brother Robert and sister in law Lisa. We pray, pray for the Palmore family as they mourn Lou's passing. Um, we pray especially for his wife, Lenora, this morning. Um, God, it was very unexpected and tragic. And so we pray that you would um, just send your spirit to them to comfort them. And God, we thank you and rejoice at the birth of little Lucy West. We pray that you would help her to become, be healthy. We thank you that she's been pretty healthy so far. We also pray for Catherine. God, we ask that you would uh, allow them to be able to go home soon and to have some sweet time together as a family. Would you give Terry and Catherine energy and wisdom uh, as they love this little girl into the Lord? We thank you for this, and we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, before I came to Dillard Baptist Church, almost a year ago now, uh, you know that I served as a high school Bible class teacher. Uh, and this Bible class wasn't your garden variety Bible study. It wasn't your typical Sunday school program. Uh, it was a class, and so we dug into the text. Uh, we had a pretty rigorous regimen as we read and studied God's Word four days a week. We covered some of the same stories you probably heard about in Sunday school. Creation, the fall. We read about the flood of Noah and the call of Abraham. How God delivered his people, Israel, from Egypt in the Exodus. But we also went off the beaten path of familiar passages, and we kind of surveyed those parts of the Bible that typically don't get as much airtime in your typical Bible study. Right? The reason we did this is because we were convinced, and this is a conviction that we share as Dale Baptist Church, that all of the Bible is God's inspired, written word to us. We don't get to choose what parts are in and what parts are out, and so we surveyed the more obscure parts, those obscure laws in the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Judges, 
And towards the end of the semester, I asked my students, I said, what were some of the things that stuck out to you from this semester? And one of the things that all of my students said is they said, the Bible is a lot darker than I expected it to be. And I said, well, explain that to me. What do you mean? And one of my students said this. He said, I thought the Bible would contain a lot of advice for living. It would have a lot of inspirational quotes. But there's a lot of messed up stuff that happens in the Bible. Even some of the heroes of our faith are those are the ones who often commit some of the most heinous sins. See, I think what happened to my students is that they'd grown up in a church and when they were little and active in a youth group, they had received a version of the gospel that was slightly sentimental. Maybe a bit sweet and saccharine, very warm. Right? They have heartwarming Bible verses that you can print on mugs, you can put on your wall. They make a nice meme that you can put on Instagram or Facebook with an encouraging Bible verse. And I think what had unwittingly happened is that they had imbibed a version of the prosperity version, the prosperity gospel, but just a little light, a little lighter. Right? So the Christian life is meant for your success, for your well-being. Right? And if you can, you know, have a warm cup of hot cocoa at the end of the day, then everything is good and well. If you use the Bible, not simply as God's inspired word, but primarily as an inspirational word. Well, during the season of Advent, as Christmas approaches, the world is going to tell us to celebrate, and there's a lot to celebrate. I don't want to be down on that. But as we journey towards Christmas, through the season of Advent, the season of longing and expectation, it's a season where we have to confront the darkness that is in our world. If we think about our community, think about our state, our nation, there are many dark, tragic things that happen day in and day out, week in and week out. And I'm not just talking about the stuff you see on the news. People's lives are affected, families are torn apart, hearts are broken. Even in our church family, there is great and tremendous suffering. And during the season of Advent, we need to look into the darkness. And the reason is, is because as we remember the coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came into the darkness. He became a human. He took on our mess. And so that's why this text in the book of Zephaniah is a fitting word for us today. Zephaniah is a book about judgment. The opening line of the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 2, God says this to the nation of Judah, I will utterly wipe away the entire world. He had to deliver that to his countrymen. And tell them that the judgment of God was coming. Zephaniah's book that you maybe haven't read too much before belongs to a group of books called the Minor Prophets. And the only thing minor about the Minor Prophets is that they're not as long, right? Isaiah is 66 chapters long, it's a major prophet. Zephaniah is three. But just because it's a short length doesn't mean it's unimportant, right? James Madison, many of you may have known his name if you watch TV. This week, you've heard Republicans and Democrats quote his name a lot because he was the author of the U.S. Constitution, the fourth president of the United States. We don't call James Madison a minor president just because he was five foot four and Abraham Lincoln was six foot four, right? He's a major president. In the same way, Zephaniah might be a minor prophet. He's short, but he has a major message for us today. He's prophesying during a dark time of Judah's history. The previous kings were two of the worst kings that Judah had ever had. They led the people into idolatry. They refused to let them worship God the way he had commanded them. But it's in the midst of this dark cloud of judgment that the ray of hope and the ray of joy shines through. And so I want us to see this today from the book of Zephaniah, that although we are undeserving of God's kindness, he saves his shameful, sinful, and sorrowful people and transforms them into a pure, safe, and joyful people. I'm going to say that one more time. Though we are undeserving of God's kindness, He transforms and saves His, his shameful, sinful, sorrowful people and transforms them into a pure, safe, and joyful people. Well, the first thing that Zephaniah tells us in our passage today is that God purifies His shameful people. I mentioned earlier this was a dark time. The king of, Israel, of Judah at the time was Josiah. And Josiah was really his, it was Judah's last great king. And the nation was in a bit of a grief from foreign powers at the time. And during his reign, he had 
discovers the book of the law, and he decides to purify Israel's worship. He tears down idol altars that are made to idols. He reinstitutes the tax that would fund the treasury to fund the worship of the temple. But there were a lot of idolaters that he had to deal with. And in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12, we read we begin that the people were complacent. It says this, At that time, this is God speaking, At that time I will search Jerusalem for lands, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, The Lord will do no good, neither will he do ill. These people are not, they're not atheists in that they don't believe in God, but they're functional atheists. Now, they believe that God exists, but they don't really believe it matters what you do, right? If you do a bunch of good, God's not going to do anything good in return. If you do a bunch of evil, God is not going to repay you with evil. And the thing about that perspective is it's always true for at least a little while, right? Especially that God will not judge the wicked. It's always true for at least a little while. But eventually God will act. He will work and come for judgment, and the people will be judged. God's timing is perfect, and so it may not be what we expect, but nevertheless, he will come. And so because of the complacency of the people, God said, Zephaniah says in chapter 1, verse 14, that the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. You think he's been sleeping, but don't worry, he's coming. God's day of the Lord is something that we read about in the Bible, and it is always in some form a day of judgment. And this isn't just referring to one day in the history, although that is a day of the Lord. But as Baptist theologian H.H. Rowley said, the day of the Lord is any day when at a specific time for specific, specific events, God's rule will be reestablished on the earth, and his people will be released from sin as sources, adherence, and effects now and more forever. And so God is going to pour out his wrath upon his people's enemies, but he also will pour it out on his people in order to turn them from their sins. And in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, God talks about the universal judgment. This isn't just going to be a judgment on Israel. It's not just going to be a judgment on Judah and Jerusalem and the ruling class. Everyone will stand before the judgment of the Lord. And after, they, after God's enemies are judged, and after he judges his people, though, there's a word of hope. And that's the word of hope that we need today. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. God says, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. The people will worship God with a pure speech because God will purify and cleanse the people. They will no longer worship the other idols. They will no longer publicly doubt God, but they will call upon His name. They will serve Him. And verse 10 demonstrates this very thing. He says, For beyond the rivers of Cush, that's modern day Ethiopia, my worshipers and my, the daughters of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. People are going to come from everywhere to worship the Lord. And the most amazing thing about this worship is that they can come to God because God has taken away their shame. God has taken away their shame. Look at verse 11. On that day you shall not be put to shame. Why? Because the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for I will remove them from your midst. God's people are free of shame. You know, there's a difference between being shameless and being free of shame. God has given every single one of us a conscience that whenever we sin, He convicts us of our sin. If we see something good, the conscience says that was a good thing. If we do something bad, if we offend God, if we break His law, we know that that sin has been committed. And the person that's shameless doesn't let anything weigh on their conscience. They can give you a bold face lie, rock to your face, they can lie to their spouse, their co-worker, their neighbor. They can cuss like a sailor and drink like one too. It doesn't bother them at all because they made themselves the moral authority. Right? Whenever I was in high school, I felt like this was what the locker room was like. Everyone was their own boss and they didn't submit to any other, any other God, any other rule. The book of Judges talks about the people of Israel being in a shameless state. It says at that time, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in Zephaniah 3, verse 5, it says he condemned the people and he says, The unjust know no shame. The unjust know no shame. They're not embarrassed at all because they're shameless. But God will take his people who are humble and he will remove their shame from them. It's not that they're shameless, but they're shame-free. It's not because they aren't aware when they sin. They're often acutely 
be aware when they sin. But God has taken away their shame by sending His Son Jesus Christ upon the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says that Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, despising the shame. And He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Our shame has been crucified with Jesus Christ on the cross and we've been purified. Right, if you're burdened with your sin today, you might be tempted to try to make yourself clean. Right, if I can abstain from worldly love and worldly delights and pleasures, maybe I'll punish myself and I'll pay for the sins that I've committed to God, then maybe I can be clean before Him and He will accept me. But the good news of the gospel is this, or 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, I say this almost every single week here. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so God takes His shameful people and He makes them pure. Well, God does this and He also gladdens His downcast people. Zephaniah shows us this. Look at verse 14. Zephaniah calls the nation of Judah and Jerusalem. He calls them to rejoice in verse 14. He says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And I think it's important to note that our joy, that our celebration in God, is actually derived from God's celebration first. Look at verse 17. It says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. One of God's primary attributes, and we must be aware of this, is that he is holy. Namely, that he is totally other from us, and that he can know no sin. He can't tolerate sin. He defends his honor. But this God who is holy is also the God of joy. Oftentimes, we can be consumed with the sins of others and the sins of the world, and we can become very easily judgmental. We can really appreciate that God judges sin. Right? This angry, mean God who's lofty, he doesn't care about humans. And this is often the caricature that you'll hear atheists say when they say, Well, I don't believe in this judgmental God who just wants to condemn all of humanity and has no care for us. If an atheist ever says that to you, you don't need to say, I don't believe in that God either. I don't believe in that God either. I do believe in a holy God who will call sinners to account. But I also believe in the God who saves. I believe in the God who rejoices in our salvation. It's not that God is just happy go lucky and doesn't care about sin. He does. But because of the salvation that He offers us in Jesus Christ, that holiness, it, whenever we encounter it, it's, we, we encounter it as His joy. It's joy because, as verse 15 says, God has taken away the judgments from us. We have nothing to fear. We have joy because the King of Israel is in our midst. And the King of Israel here, in verse 15, it's not Josiah. It's not King Ahaz. It's not King Manasseh. It's not King David. No, the King is God Himself. The King of Israel, Yahweh, He is in your midst. This is something that John the Baptist knew a little bit about, as Judy read for us earlier from Luke chapter 1. Whenever his mother Elizabeth was carrying her in the womb, and her relative Mary came to her, and Jesus was in the womb of Mary, John knew that God was near him. He felt the presence of the Lord, and he leapt for joy. In the same way, whenever we encounter God in our presence, we don't fear, but we have joy. Whenever Jesus was with his disciples in Mark chapter 2, verse 19, the Pharisees came up to him and they said, Jesus, your disciples that are with you, whenever it's time to fast, they don't fast. What's the deal? And Jesus said to them, Whenever the bridegroom is in the presence of the wedding party, nobody fasts because it's a time of celebration. And the fact that we celebrate that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world, as John 1 14 says, the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The King has arrived, and therefore we should be joyful. And that's why Advent is a season of joy. 
Jesus Christ has come, and he is coming again to save his people and to judge the living and the dead. So let us rejoice with John. Right? In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 14, which we read just a moment ago, nearly every single word is a different form of the word rejoice. So whenever God comes and he saves us, whenever he delivers us from the judgment, we should be joyful. Because God gladdens his downcast people. Well, finally, in this text in Zephaniah, we see that God saves local people. God saves local people. In verse 18, God says, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, that you will no longer suffer reproach. Previously, God had gathered his enemies for judgment, but now he gathers his people for worship. Now, there was a time in Zephaniah's day when people who wanted to come to the temple and worship God were not able to. Right? Israel had four feasts that they celebrated every year, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. And these were the holy calendar that Israel followed. And they weren't following these things, although God commanded that they should celebrate them every single year to remember the Exodus, to remember that God takes away their sins. And the, the feasts weren't happening. And what God says is they don't need to mourn any longer. For they will come to worship. I want you to imagine for just a second that the month of December rolls around, and you're not allowed to mention the word Christmas. You can't hang up a tree. You can't set out a nativity set. You're not allowed to say Merry Christmas to anyone. Or imagine our brothers and sisters around the world who are not able to join with other brothers today to worship God because of the danger that faces them. I would imagine that just like the people of Israel experienced, we would mourn. Because we want to gather with the people of God in worship. And what God says is that whenever He returns, whenever He comes back, that we will gather in worship. We will no longer suffer the reproach of others. And He promises in verse 19 and 20 to save those people, to save the lame, to save, save the outcast, the lowly. Whenever Jesus came on earth, I want you to just think for a minute if you read the Gospels, who did Jesus associate with? He sometimes rubbed shoulders with the high and mighty. They invited him to a dinner party and he would go. But Jesus was known for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He hung out with prostitutes, with the blind, the lame, those who were down and out, the broke, busted, and disgusted. Jesus came for them. And brothers and sisters, the salvation that we experience in Christ is a salvation that we do not deserve. But God saves us in order that we might worship and serve Him. Right? And this is a people that's not just for our neighborhood. It's a promise that is for the entire world. Remember back in verse 10, God said that He would call people from Cush, from all the Ethiopia. God would call them and bring them, call them to Jerusalem to worship His name. But we are far beyond the prayer of Ethiopia from the perspective of Jerusalem. We, the reason that you and I believe in Jesus Christ is because the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. And even now, we have brothers and sisters, missionaries who are serving to reach unreached people groups, places where the gospel has still never been heard. We're trying to reach those who've never heard that they too may believe in Jesus Christ. God saves the global people. Remember this although we are undeserving of God's kindness, he saves his shameful, sinful, sorrowful people and transforms them into a pure, saved, and joyful people. I hope that the words of Zephaniah today have encouraged you this morning. But remember, as I start with this sermon, we have to receive the words of Zephaniah as we confront the darkness. We can't simply pretend it doesn't exist, even if just for one hour every Sunday morning. We must be aware of the darkness that is outside. Because the darkness of our world is real. And so we shouldn't just put on a fake smile and try to suck it up and make it through, but rather, armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, armed with the good news that God sent His Son into the world to take on human flesh, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins, to raise again from the dead, and now He's sitting at the right hand of God as we await His return. But that good news means that we can receive salvation. That the joy that we don't deserve, we can experience in Jesus Christ. We go into the world of sin and death, because that's where Jesus Christ went. 
We see the hurts of the world, the sorrows, and we go to them and let them know that Jesus Christ has come. Are you hurting this morning? Are you hurting? Are you aware of your sin? Do you feel shame from that? Well, I want to call you today to cry out to Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, you can have salvation. The shame that you experience can be taken away. The guilt that you have of offending the Holy God will be forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. And you can have joy. Today is a great day for it to be Joy Sunday. We start the service off with the baptism, and in just a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. The meal that Jesus Christ left for his disciples. And I want to ask today, what are the meal? Reminds us of the day that we can be pure by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. What other meal reminds us of our salvation, that Jesus Christ bore our sins upon the cross? And what other meal can give us joy? Knowing that because of this, that God does not look at us with condemnation, but that He looks upon us with joy. If you would, please bow your head. Father, we come to you now. We thank you for your word. We thank you that, God, this joy that we don't deserve, this joy that uh, is so easily we so easily forget. God, we thank you for it. And we ask that you to remind us of it. God, would you help the cross to always be before our eyes? God, while we were a shameless people, you cleansed us from our sins. You made us pure. You made our speech pure so that we can come before you without shame. God, while we were a people who were downcast, aware of the weight of our sin, God, you took joy in us and took away the judgment. God, so would you give us joy? And God, while we were lost in our sin and unable to worship you, you saved us. You saved us and called us to yourself. God, we thank you for this and we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ.